Hello, good morning and welcome to Equippers Essex Online. We're here on Facebook and on YouTube and it's really great to have you with us this morning. So let's get ready to pray this morning. Lord God, we welcome you this morning, Father. We welcome your Holy Spirit, Lord. Father, we, we open our hearts and our minds to receive everything that you have for us, Lord God. Father, we thank you for the incredible blessing of being able to um, watch online, to be able to come together collectively online, Lord. And Father, even though we're in our own individual homes, Lord, Father, I thank you that your Holy Spirit is there and that we have open hearts and that you are willing to come, Lord, and you're willing to minister to us, Lord. And so, Father God, I just pray, Father, that as we head into summer, Lord, that you would just bring about such a sense of community, Lord. Father, that you would um, provide us with the confidence to invite people to church, to speak to people, Lord, that you would, you would empower us to make the most of every single opportunity that we have that comes along, Father. As the weather improves, Lord, and as we, we start to go out and we start to meet people and we start to do lots of outdoor activities with the summer, Lord, Father God, I just pray for God encounters. I pray for good opportunities, Lord, that each and every one of us would have an opportunity to share the gospel, to share the good news of you, Father, to, to tell people about you, Father, that you would give us a fiery boldness, Lord, as we go out and about this summer, Lord, and we meet people, Father, that you would just put the words in our mouths, Lord. Father, that in situations where we don't feel confident, that you would give us the confidence, that you would go before us, Lord, Father. And that as we move through the summer and we come into September, Lord, Father, I pray that there would just be such an abundance of new people in church, Father, people that are, are hungry and passionate for you, Lord God. Father, that there would just be such a, a, a growth, Father, in our church family, Lord. Father, really believe that we're going to see incredible growth, Lord. And so, Father, I just we just commit this morning to you and we, we commit this to you, Father, and we look forward to everything that you're going to do, Lord. We love you, Lord, and we honour you and we glorify you this morning, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. So let's get ready to receive the word this morning. Um, I hope that you're going to be really blessed and encouraged by this message. So let's get ready to tune in now. Awesome. Who's up for a preach then? I've been away for three Sundays. In the whole 18 years of our church life, I've never been away three Sundays on the trot before. And what that says to me is I'm getting lazy. Now, now what it says to me is that we're getting stronger. Because we're not building the church around the gift of one man. We're building the church around a team of people who come together as a family. And we're relying on Jesus, not relying on me. Yeah, I know I'm brilliant. But we're, but we're relying on him. You've missed me, haven't you? <laughs> <laughs> so I was preaching in Wales three Sundays ago. And then I was in Ghana with Josh. And then last Sunday, uh, the church in New Malden was launching in a new building. And I went to preach there. Last night, I was in Surrey preaching at a men's event, 120 guys together. So, so powerful seeing men respond. The worship was deep, but uh, it was such a good time. But it's my greatest privilege to talk to you guys. This is where my heart is. It's with you. I want to see nothing more than you guys just excel in all your dreams. Fulfill who you were supposed to be. Help you fight against the things that come at you in this world. And I've got what I believe is going to be a powerful message. And I've wrestled with it for a long time. So I know it's going to be a powerful message. Do you know when you, you've got something to discharge? And you're like, oh, you know, do I say it like that? Do I say it like this? You know that God's on it. So can we pray? Father, thank you for this brilliant, brilliant church. No one here is just an individual on their own. They're part of a family. No one here is just a bum on a seat, but they're an awesome human being made in your image, full of hope and life and skills and potential. Lord, I pray that you could help us wrestle through life together, empowered by the Holy Spirit to demonstrate what heaven looks like on earth. I pray for freedom for people today. 
I pray that people would leave this place full of hope. And I pray that in Jesus' name and everyone said, amen, amen, amen. The title of this message, those who like titles, is The God You Know Is The God You'll Show. The God you know is the God you show. I don't know what revelations you have of God, but you may know him as God is my provider, Jehovah Jireh, all sufficient one, the God of more than enough. And that will be displayed in your life. If you know him as provider, you will find it easy to give. You will find it easy to be generous. You will find it easy to tithe. It won't be an issue to you. Because you know that you can never outgive God. And if, if I know him, if I've had a revelation of him as my provider, then I can give freely, I can be generous freely on any given occasion, knowing that my God will never leave me short. If you struggle with giving, and lots of people do, maybe today's the day you get a fresh revelation. God will provide. Do you know what he says in 2 Corinthians chapter 9? He gives seed to the sower. I wonder if we go to work... We earn, our, we earn our, our wages, they come in and we go, that's the fruit of my labour. Anyone use that? Oh, look at the 10 million pounds I've earned this month. Just prophesying. <laughs> oh, that's the fruit of my labour. But when we treat it like fruit, who knows what we do with fruit? We eat it. But if we treat it like seed, we sow it. And who knows, there's more fruit in seed than, than you can eat. It multiplies, and we serve the God of multiplication. If you're someone who's wrestling with giving and generosity, can I challenge you today? Have a revelation of the God who supplies. And he supplies seed to the sower. So if he can get it through you, he'll get it to you. That's the God I serve. But Sarah and I are always challenging ourselves. Sarah's harsh. I don't like, we go to another church service or an event. Oh, well, should we give this amount? I do a little card that side, and she says, double it. I'm like, wow, okay. You can't say no to that, though, can you? So uh, praise the Lord. We are challenging ourselves to be better givers. And here's my reality. I've never outgiven God. Every time I've challenged myself out of my comfort zone to say, come on, let's sow a seed. You know, we sowed a seed into the, to the Ghanaian church there, and they're growing. And, and I'm believing God's going to give us more than we could ever give away. Are you with me? Yeah. Give the person next to you a dig in the ribs. Say, come on, know the God who provides. Maybe you know God as protector, you know, Jehovah Nisi, the banner that is over me. It comes from this idea that when they were in fights together, they would have a standard, which is a flag, yeah? You've probably seen all the epic movies where thousands of people run into each other. And I mean, what? If you're at the front, you've got no chance. I'm definitely hanging back in that fight. They run into each other and they get battered a little bit and win a couple. And then they have to look around. Where am I? I'm a bit dazed. I can see the flag. I can see the standard. I can see our banner. And they run to the banner because they know it's a safe place. Well, who knows? Jehovah Nisi. God is our banner. When we're, we're disorientated, when we don't know what we're doing, when we're struggling, we look for the banner, we go there and we are safe. When you are safe, you never have to fear about anything. So you can display that in your life. The God you know will be the God you show. If you're full of anxiousness, if you're full of fear and worry and doubt and all these things, get to know the God who protects you because he loves you. Are you with me? You might know him as healer, the shepherd who guides, your righteousness, all-powerful one. These are all the attributes of God and your revelation on him will be displayed in how you live. The God you know will be the God you show. But there's an attribute in God's character that I think we've let slip out of church life. And I believe he wants to reintroduce, reintroduce himself to us in this way. And it's this. God is our deliverer. God is our deliverer. Amen. Let me just read you four passages super quick to get this biblical context. 2 Samuel 22 and 2. I love all that. 2 Samuel 22, 2. And he said... The Lord is my rock and my fortress and my deliverer. Psalm chapter 40 and verse 17. But I am poor and needy, yet the Lord thinks upon me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Proverbs 21 verse 31 says this. The horse is prepared for the day of battle, but deliverance is of the Lord. Finally, Galatians 1 verses 3 and 4. Grace to you. And peace from God the Father and our Lord Jesus Christ, who gave himself for our sins, and he might deliver us from this present age of evil, according to the will of God and our Father. Can you see it there? 
I could bring out verse after verse after verse where one of the attributes of our God is he is our deliverer. Are you with me? Even when Jesus preaches and teaches on prayer, what does he say? Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Can you see? It's even in how we're called to pray. We need to know our God as our deliverer. I like this idea that the whole thing about delivery is taking something from one position to another. Um, anyone a postman in the room? Got no po- we used to have some postmen. Oh, yeah, David at the back's a postman. Yeah, round of applause for David at the back, the postman. He would know how to deliver. He will have something in his bag and he will deliver it. It will come from his bag into your place. That's a delivery, yeah? What Jesus is doing is taking us out of the clutches of evil and delivering us into freedom. He's taking us out of a place of no hope and delivering us into a place of hope. He's taking us out of a place of lack of vision into a place of lots of vision. He's our deliverer. Are you with us? Come on. My favorite, well, one of my favorite verses in the Bible, John 10.10, 10, I use this a lot, but it's just, it's just brilliant. Jesus speaking. The thief does not come except to steal and kill and destroy, but I have come that you might have life and have it more abundantly. It's great, isn't it? And here's the thing. Whenever I preach and teach on that, I always home in on that I've come. Jesus has come that you would have life. And that's compelling, isn't it? That's like, yes, come on. But we don't often hang on the thief. Who knows that we have an adversary? Satan, the word Satan, means adversary, the one who opposes us. And his ploys are right there. This is what he wants to do to you. Kill, steal, and destroy. And the trouble is, it's a spiritual dynamic. We are spiritual people. And our enemy, our adversary, Satan, comes in with the goal to ruin your world. And he comes in and does it through spiritual dynamics. When you see the Israelite people in Egypt, they're oppressed. They have been there for hundreds of years and they're struggling. They're being whipped by slave drivers, made to build more. They can't live the full life. They can't make their own decisions. They can't just do what they want to do. They are forced and oppressed into living a certain way. And I think it's a shadow for us, biblically speaking, so that we can see, does that relate to me today? Do you ever feel like you're trapped in a cycle of life? It's not the full life. You're doing things that you don't want to do. It's getting deep now, I can feel it. Having behaviours and attitudes that you don't like, but you feel stuck there. Are you with me? Addiction is a classic. We all understand about addiction, don't we? If someone is addicted, they keep doing the thing they don't want to do. And even though they don't like it, they keep doing it. And they wake up the next morning saying, I'm not going to do that anymore, and find themselves doing it, because it's an addiction. Well, who knows? Addiction is a ploy of our enemy. If addiction can oppress you, it forces you to live a certain way. You're in a cycle you don't want to be in, and it's not full life. The good news is, I came that you would have full life. I am your deliverer. I will take you out from addiction and into freedom. Are you hearing me? Sometimes we just get stuck in this cycle of life and we can all relate to it at one level or another. What about anger? You know, someone treated you so poorly all those years ago and it made you angry. I didn't deserve that. That was unfair. You can relate to this stuff. All of us have had that at some level or another, I'm sure. But for some people, it gets cut so deep, it just gets you. And what happens is you treat everyone and you treat every circumstances through that filter of anger. And it's not that you're an angry person or you're a bad person. You got treated so bad that you start closing down and defending yourself and protecting yourself. It's not who Jesus made you to be. But that situation has landed on you and now this anger is on you and it oppresses you. And it changes how you see things and it changes how you behave. And it's unattractive and it absolutely isn't the full life. That Jesus is our deliverer. I want you to know this. That addiction never owns you. Anger never owns you. It might be able to oppress you. And when we can understand that Jesus bought us at a price. Here it is in 1 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 23. 
in the New Living Translation, it says this, God paid a high price for you, so don't be enslaved by the world. If you're a Christian in this room, you belong to Jesus. He owns you. Now, things can come in and oppress you, but they can never own you. And here's why we can relate with this whole picture in Egypt with Moses. Because God calls Moses to himself. He says, I've heard the cry of my people. They're enslaved, they're oppressed, they're struggling. They're saying, God, save us, help us. And he raises up Pharaoh. And this is what he says in Exodus 9 and verse 1. The Lord said to Moses, go into Pharaoh and tell him, thus says the Lord God of the Hebrews, let my people go that they may serve me. Can you see it? They're mine. Let my people go. They're mine. They belong to me. So I'm sending Moses in as what? I'm sending Moses in as a deliverer. I'm taking you out of slavery, out of oppression, out of this cycle of life which is painful, and I'm delivering you into the promise. Are you with me? And he uses Moses to do that. Who knows that Moses is a forerunner for Jesus then? Because Jesus came and paid the ultimate price so that he could deliver you from anything that attacks you. Come on, this is important, isn't it? This has never happened before. Come on, someone needs some deliverance today. Someone needs some freedom today. Jesus paid a high price for me and for you. And he's jealous for us. So if you're someone who wrestles with addiction, if you're someone who wrestles with anger, if you're someone who feels oppressed under all kinds of things, can I say that Jesus says, I'm coming in to set you free. I'm coming in to deliver you into a place of hope. Deliverance takes us from one position and positions us in another. Are you with me? Here's the kind of things that I think we often wrestle with. Addiction, rejection, fear, low self-esteem, anxiety, anger and bitterness, all these things we've heard spoken about, you may wrestle with yourself and you need to know this, they are an attack from our enemy who's your adversary. He comes to kill, steal and destroy, but Jesus has already declared over us, I came that you would live and I've paid a price for you and I've overcome everything that can come at you and so I'm delivering you from that into hope. So I want to declare over you today, whatever you're struggling with now, you can leave this place and know that you have a victory in Jesus and he's taking you somewhere new. Let my people go. Let Equippers Church Essex go. Let that amazing lady go. Let that amazing man go. Let that amazing child go. I've paid the price for him. Go. Here in Mark chapter 9, we find Jesus... And he meets this guy whose son's having a terrible time in Mark 9, 17 to 27. One of the crowd answered and said, Teacher, I have brought my son who has a mute spirit. And wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He foams at the mouth, gnashes his teeth and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered and said to him, O faithless generation, how long will I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has this been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him both into the fire and to the water to destroy him. Can you see that? He's trying to destroy him. It's a ploy of our enemy. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believes. Immediately, the father of the child cried out and said, Lord, I believe. Help my unbelief. When Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the unclean spirit, saying to it, deaf and dumb spirit, I command you, come out of him and enter him no more. Then the spirit cried out, convulsed him greatly and came out of him. And he became as one dead, so that many said, he's dead. But Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up, and he arose. What a great picture of this lad that's been oppressed by evil. He grabs him, and we can see the goal. He's trying to destroy him, throw him in the fire, throw him in the water. But then he meets the deliverer, and the deliverer says, come out. He's mine. And he acts like he's dead but Jesus just says come on up we get and I believe today someone's going to get up I believe today someone's going to take the hand of Jesus and get fresh hope like they've never had before 
I wonder when we look at things like this, what does rejection look like? I've been pastoring this church for 18 years. And I want to say, in my experience, the most common wrestle people have is with rejection. And it can happen most often in your childhood. When you go to a counsellor outside of church, often they'll say, tell me about your childhood. So much happens in childhood, doesn't it? Parents, we need to parent our children well because it affects so much. And they'll say, oh, well, dad was absent or mum was horrendous to me or I went to school and the teacher abused me or my friends always pushed me aside and in the end they start closing in and they can't be who they were called to be. They close up because they're rejected. And what happens then is it becomes something else. It becomes low self-esteem. No one likes me. I'm worthless. What's the point? And they start dressing in clothes to hide away into the background so often that you know, people cover themselves up and become a bit dark and withdrawn. And it's not because they were made like that. It's because they were rejected and they're dealing with it. And they find themselves in low self-esteem. And that can then enter into depression. And I'm sure we all know someone who's depressed. Well, did it start there or did it start somewhere different? And is it of God or is it of our enemy? And I know there is great education around it and there are great skills and practical things we can do to help with that. But I also want to say it's a spiritual dynamic because our enemy is a spiritual dynamic. And he comes in and he brings in depression, he brings in low self-esteem and he brings in rejection. It's messing people up. And Jesus said, but I came, you'd have life. And I'm the deliverer, if you'd believe. I love what it says there. He was having his life ruined, this young lad. And in verse 22 it says, Often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. It's just like, how many lives are being destroyed by a spiritual dynamic? Because there's an enemy that hates us. And the reason he hates us is because we are God's favoured creation. It's us that Jesus died for. And so he's coming for us. And we don't need to fear that because he's already overcome. But we need to believe in that. I love this here. It says, Jesus said to him, if you can believe, all things are possible for him who believes. And we always amen that. But we need to not just amen it. We need to get it in our hearts so we live like that. If we could believe. Immediately, the father of the child cried and said, Lord, I do believe. Help my unbelief. Is that our dynamic? I believe God can do all things. But I also kind of haven't seen enough of it, so I, I, I need some unbelief to be helped. Are you with me? I love his honesty. I, I do believe you, Jesus, but, but help me with it. And what I love is this. Jesus doesn't answer that question. He doesn't say, well, let's have a chat about your unbelief. He doesn't do that, does he? He just gets on and does it. And who knows? Jesus just wants us to see something sometimes. Because when you see something, what happens? It helps your unbelief. You know, if you're up against a bill and you can't pay it, and you're like, God, help me, I know you're the provider, and the next day an envelope comes in, or the next day you receive an email letting you off the debt, you're like, wow, that has helped your unbelief. You need to tell people that story. Because testimony says do it again. So when you tell someone your testimony, they're like, if he did it for you, he could do it for me. That helps my unbelief. Oh, my, my daddy was sick in, in hospital. and not, not in real, I'm telling a story here. My dad's fine, he's at the back. <laughs> my daddy's he's sick and he's in hospital and he's struggling with his health. And Lord, help. And suddenly someone comes in, lays hands on that man and he gets up. And it's just like, wow, that helped my unbelief. We need to hear those stories. Because what does it do? It helps our unbelief. All of us believe all things are possible with Jesus, don't we? Rose of hands. Do you believe all things are possible? See? But the truth is, do we really believe all things are possible? And that's the struggle. We believe it, but we've still got an element of unbelief. But what happens is, as God gives us stories, as God shows us some stuff, it helps our unbelief. If God could build a, a building in Ghana, could he do it in Colchester? Do you see? Help our unbelief. You know, I, I don't want to be meeting in a school forever. I think God's growing us in this place and it's good and it's helpful. But my dream is to have a warehouse that seats a thousand people, that doesn't have microphones that keep blowing up on us. <laughs> Where we can, we can serve the community here. We can invite them in and have coffee and we can have play groups and mum and toddlers groups and counselling sessions and school classes and we could just be the hub of the community. That's the dream. But right now we're here. Lord, help my unbelief. Show us something. Are you with me? Because the enemy wants to rob me of my belief. 
Oh, you've been in that school for two years now, Barry. You thought it happened by now, didn't you? Oh, is God really going to do it? And it chips away at my belief. But sometimes I have to remind myself that my God is good. And my God is able. And might not be in my timing, it'll be in his timing. But when I get there, and we will get there, we're going to say, God knew the best time. Yeah. You guys need to help my unbelief sometimes. We all need to encourage each other, don't we? The day will come when we step into a building and we, you know, we're a good-sized church, don't get me wrong, but we are going to treble and quadruple and five-tuple in numbers. Are you with me? Do I need to help your unbelief? Do you know, in our, in our nation, the average-sized church in Great Britain is 56 people. That's average. I believe when everyone's here, we, we're over 200 people. We're already four times the size of an, an average church. But my, belief, my faith is for thousands. There's only about a handful of churches in our nation that are over 1,000. Those of you who are African people, big churches in Africa. It's normal. It's not normal here. American churches, you see them on the telly, thousands of people. That's not normal here. But I don't serve a normal God. I serve an outrageous God. And I've got a big vision. And I've got a great bunch of people who, when I need you, will help my unbelief. But the day will come when we're in this venue and we will look out and go, wow, look at what God has done. But on the journey to there, Jesus wants to help every individual in this room to not be the same there as you are here. And if you're struggling with fear, if you're struggling with anger, if you're struggling with rejection, if you're struggling with hatred, if you're struggling with bitterness, if you're struggling with anxiety... I've got some news for you. The deliverer is in the room. And wouldn't it be so awesome if we helped our unbelief and said, show me, Lord. And someone walked out of this place freer than the way they came in. Are you with me? There's, um, I want to get a little bit controversial here. There's a, um, a phrase in Alcoholics Anonymous. Now, obviously, they practically deal with addiction. And it says this, once an alcoholic always an alcoholic. And all the spiritual people in this room will go, no, those who are the sunset free are free indeed. And, like, Wah! and I agree with that. But I took the time to understand why they say that. These are professional people, at least in a world sense. Why would they say that? Because there's purpose to it. They will often introduce themselves in their meetings and they say, hi, my name's Big Dave. Um, and I'm an alcoholic, but I've been sober for 15 years. And now I've got well played, well played, well played. Why say that? 15 years. Why keep saying that? And in terms of the natural, and, you know, great people like Dr. Caroline Leaf who are helping us understand the brain and pathways and neurons and these kind of things, people who have lived addicted to something like alcohol, when they have alcohol once more, suddenly it quickens them. Me or you could have a drink of alcohol. It wouldn't affect us. They have alcohol, and they're like, oh, I want more. And, and so what they're doing by de declaring that, they're keeping the place they came from in front of them. I remember what I've been delivered from. And you think, wow, now that's a bigger thing. I'm not an alcoholic, actually, because I've been sober for 15 years, but I remember where I was come from. My name's Barry. I'm an alcoholic. I've been sober for 52 years. <laughs> Do you see what I mean? And it's just like, so I, I remember where I came from. And sometimes when we remember where we came from, it stirs our faith again. I remember what Jesus did for me. It was 15 years ago, but he stepped into my world and delivered me. And I'm never going to forget it. And sometimes I think deliverance is only as powerful as our practices. You know, the Bible talks about being delivered of issues and your room is swept clean. But if you allow an opening again, it comes back seven times worse. That's a biblical concept. And so by keeping your deliverance in front of you, it stops you from stepping back into that. So, so if, you're gonna, if, you're gonna have, if you've had trouble with alcohol, you don't want to step back in there again. So you clean your place out and you remember. And you say, Holy Spirit, come and fill the gaps. Empower me to keep going. You're never on your own in this kind of stuff. Are you hearing me? I love this thought. Spiritually speaking, your praise is only as strong as your memory. Who knows? If this week you prayed and uh, you had a bill you couldn't pay and someone posted an envelope through your door and there was £50,000 in it, again prophesying, if that happened to you on Wednesday just gone, who knows when Io starts praying the African music, you're not like, 
You're like, Jesus, 50 grand. Thank you. Jehovah Jireh, hallelujah. Three months down the line. Because we forget. Your praise is only as powerful as your memory. Remind yourself of what Jesus did for you. And maybe there's nothing personal right now, but I know what he did do for you. He hung on a cross so you could have life everlasting. That's worth praising. In fact, it's worth praising now. I'm friendly with a, a pastor called Glyn Barrett, who's the pastor of Audacious Church in Manchester, which Katongo is going to go and visit in the summer, which is really cool. A brilliant, brilliant church, and they are a church of thousands. He's done amazing things. You know he's doing well when he got invited to the coronation. He was there. So cool. He's only my age. He's brilliant. Young man. Younger man. <laughs> but someone came to visit his church from a more traditional background. And uh, they were to be a similar style to us, loud, rocky, but on a bigger scale. And uh, he saw this, this visitor saw this girl in the front row, and she was crazy praising, you know, over the top crazy praising. And this guy came up to Glyn Barrett, and he went, oh, Oh, it's good what you're doing. What's that? That's just a bit showy, isn't it? What's that all about? You know, who, who really does that? And uh, Glyn said, well, maybe you can think that. But three months ago, that girl was a prostitute. And she came into our church at the end of herself, hating herself. And in the last three months, we've taken on our own journey to understand who Jesus made her to be. She's been set free from the things that oppressed her, and she's quite happy about it. Is it okay if she praises like that? And the guy's like, I'll just leave now. I'll take my coat. <laughs> but wouldn't it be great, church, if next Sunday we turn up remembering what Jesus has done for us? And we don't have to have the band saying, come on, church, get into it. No, no, I don't need to get into it. I remember what he's done for me. I'm already into it. Because my praise is on the forefront of my mind. Here's the thing. If you are plagued by fear, hurt, anxiousness, worry, darkness, pain, addiction, lust. Come on, we haven't touched on lust. I think lust, well, probably years ago, used to be a male thing, but I now know it's not just a male thing. The pornography industry is massive. And on the one hand, it seems like, what difference does it make? I'm just watching that. But this is the difference it makes. It ruins your marriage. It changes how men see women and how women see men. It changes the expectation on what a physical relationship could look like. And when you get into that physical relationship, I can pretty much promise you it's not like what you watched on the telly. And then you're disappointed. And are you disappointed with yourself or are you disappointed with your partner? But either way, there's disappointment. Is that full life or is that an enemy robbing you? So let's deal with it, everyone here. Let's get lust out of our life. Lust is not good. Lust is just a physical animal act. We are called to love and the outworking of love is we have a physical relationship. But we live in a world that is so full of lust, and I'm promising you this, it's ruining relationships. Don't let it get you. And if it has got you, either say, Jesus, help me. Be my deliverer. Take me from that place of bondage and into a place of freedom. Or chat to someone. I think so many people are stuck in bondage because of pride. Oh, I couldn't possibly tell someone I'm, I'm watching that. Or I couldn't possibly tell someone that I spent all that money that I shouldn't have spent. Or I couldn't possibly tell someone that I feel so anxious all the time. It's eating me up, but I'm a bit embarrassed to tell someone. That's keeping you in bondage. And Jesus said, I came that you'd have life. Amen. And we've got a church full of brilliant people. Put your hand up if you're perfect. No one here is perfect. Praise the Lord. Everyone here has got an issue. So if you go to someone with your issue, you can pretty, be pretty sure that you haven't got their issue. Maybe their issue is bigger than your issue. Maybe you're actually okay. But the good thing is, Jesus doesn't want us to have any issues. And if we could be open enough with each other in belief that Jesus actually is our deliverer. Not just a word in a text, not just what the Bible says, but in my heart believing it. So that the God I know is the God I show. And I get set free from the things that hold me. Are you with me? I love the fact that in the story we read about that lad, that the dad brought him to Jesus when he was vomiting, convulsing, frothing at the mouth, throwing himself on the floor. Now, no one yet is doing that. But the dad said, I, I want freedom so much. I don't care what it looks like. And he brought him to him. 
And Jesus didn't go, hang on a minute, clean yourself up, son. No, Jesus isn't bothered by your mess. He's just wanting you to believe that he could deliver you from it. So if we could come to Jesus and say, yeah, I've got my stuff. I find it a bit embarrassing. I thought I'd be more whole than this, but I believe you're my deliverer. And in the midst of my mess, could you set me free from it? So that my marriage is better, so that my relationship with money is better, so that my physical health is better, so that I connect with you spiritually better. My life will just get whole, which is what Jesus always wanted. I just want to encourage you for coming this morning because so many people could stay away from church for all kinds of reasons and some of them are how you feel about yourself and the way you live but you came and this is what I love about that that when Jesus went to visit Jairus and Jairus his daughter had died he went into the room and he took his disciples because they believed because they believed and he took him in there and then everyone who he wasn't sure believed that he, he could raise her, he got him out of the room. Why did Jesus do that? Because Jesus wanted to do his greatest miracles in a place of faith. He didn't want people sitting, there, sitting in that room going, oh, I don't think this is going to happen. She's dead. No, get out. If you can't believe with me, get out. And so he gathered people who would believe with him and their combined faith in that room shifted something and who knows Jairus's daughter got up so you've come here this morning to sit with a bunch of people who believe and I don't know what your situation is and it might not be too bad or it might be horrendous but I know there's faith in this room that Jesus could deliver you from it that you could actually leave this place better than the way you come in and it's not just a nice line from Pastor Barry it's our reality because we believe that and the God we know is the God we will show. I think I'd just love to pray for you. Would you stand? I'd love it if you were willing just to close your eyes a moment and give Jesus your full attention. You don't have to if that's awkward for you, but I think it's helpful. Let's give Jesus the one who delivers our full attention. Holy Spirit, we just engage with you. Thank you for your presence here. Let us become more aware of your presence. Come and touch hearts and lives right now. Holy Spirit, even now, I pray that you could bring to mind something you want to deal with in our lives what is that thing that's oppressing you holding you back from freedom stopping you from entering the promise of God in your life is it an addiction is it fear is it pride is it lust is it anxiety and worry is it hurt, anger, frustration? So many people wrestle with these things and then none of them are from Jesus. It's the ruse of our enemy who comes to kill, steal and destroy. Lord, what do you want to deal with today? Help us, help us. even now I want to speak to people's faith speak to people's belief that you would believe that Jesus can get you out of this this cycle you find yourselves in Jesus will deliver you stir your faith church Lord I want to pray for people who are hurting right now life hasn't played out exactly how we hoped we've been let down we didn't get the answer we hoped for we're not where we wanted to be and we can just sense this hurt resting on us and it's impeding our full life 
So if you're someone carrying hurt right now, I just declare the freedom of Jesus over you. Let it go. Give it to him. Give it to him. Deliver us, Lord God. Take us out of hurt and into wholeness. that we all get anxious and worried sometimes and that's okay but what about anxious and worry when it's too much too often hampering your freedom let's go to Jesus as the deliverer today who came for full life and I break the power of anxiousness and worry in Jesus name over you and say be free give it to him let him take you out of that and into freedom declare the deliverance of Jesus over you freedom from that control let him take you from that place into a place where you can breathe again Lord there's so many things but I pray you could highlight to everyone what you want to do personally for them today deliverer for some of you that will be enough you'll be prompted your faith is stirred you believe that Jesus can take you somewhere new and you will walk it out you'll change your lifestyle you'll think differently speak differently but for some people you might need someone to stand with you so there will be a team at the front here to pray with you afterwards or maybe you want to call someone up and say, look, I had some stuff stirred on Sunday. I need some help. Could you stand with me? Let's see this thing through. Let's see some genuine freedom. Not just a nice message on a Sunday, but actually changing my world. I encourage you to pursue it. But the last thing I want to do this morning is give opportunity for anyone to get their heart right with Jesus. Maybe you've never known Jesus. You've never said, you're welcome in my world. Maybe you once were close to Jesus, but you really know that you're so distant now and that's not good. It's the day the day you get right. It's the day the day you say, Jesus, you are welcome in my heart. Come and be my king. Just with every eye closed, if that's you today and you'd like to pray that prayer, just throw your hand up and we're going to pray together. Thank you, Jesus. God bless you. Thank you. So good. Let's do it this way. I'll pray a line and then the whole church together, you follow that line. So we're praying together. Father God, thank you for Jesus. Thank you that you love me just the way I am. But you love me too much to leave me as I am. Today, I invite you into my heart to be my Lord, my Saviour and my friend. I'm sorry for excluding you, but today, be central. And all God's people said, Amen.